This is a pulley. Most of us have seen pulleys before. In physics, a lot of times we use pulleys to demonstrate how unbalanced forces cause motion. And so in this case, I have a balance pulley. I've got two weights of equal size, and they are both able to keep each other kind of exactly where they are. This is a system in what's called equilibrium. But if I decide to change the weight of one side of this pulley or the other, I throw it off of equilibrium because now there is a larger force of gravity on one side than the other. So if I take even a small weight and add it, first it has to actually get on there. There we go. All of a sudden, the other side suddenly shifts. And equilibrium is broken, and now this side sits here on the ground, and this side is hanging up there in the air. And I can go back, and I can do the same thing all over again, and shift it again. Pulleys are a great way of showing how forces affect motion. And that's where we're going for this week. We've already been able to identify forces. We know how to calculate some of those forces. This week is really focused on using those forces to predict how an object is going to move. And since we've already got pulleys set up, it's a great place to start. Now, the other thing that you're going to see as kind of a vocabulary term this week is something called an Atwood's machine. An Atwood's machine is just a system of pulleys and weights that is used to demonstrate motion. So, let's go ahead and take a look at a couple of basic motion problems. We'll apply Newton's laws, and then we'll get into something more complicated with the Atwood's machines. Let's go ahead and get started. So let's go ahead and start with some basic strategy on how to deal with force problems. And the first thing that we are going to want to do is we need to identify the forces that are acting on our object. We can only look at one object at a time, but a single object can have multiple forces acting on it. And so we're going to want to identify all of those forces first, and we need to figure out what direction those forces are attempting to move the object. Once we've got our list of the forces that are being applied, we can then quantify things and solve it. We can go ahead and apply numbers to our situation and get a final answer. And so those are, that's our three-step strategy for dealing with force problems. And so let's go ahead and try an example. In this example, I'm going to be looking at a car that is accelerating down a road. So let's go ahead and we'll draw our car. As per the usual, it is kind of a boxy car, but you get the idea. And my car has a force coming from the engine, so this would be an applied force from the engine, of 2,000 newtons. Now, the car is also experiencing a couple of other forces that we can deal with. We know that my force of gravity is going to be applied downwards. And I'm going to go ahead and be consistent and draw everything from the midpoint. So I've got a force of gravity. Let's call this uh, 8,000 Newton force. I know that I have an equivalent force of, from the normal force that is also at 8,000 Newtons. Because the car is neither sinking nor is it rising. And... I have some forces of air resistance and friction, and the force of friction on this object is going to be 1,000 newtons. So I've identified all of the forces that are acting on my object, and you can see I've also given directional arrows. Now the first thing I can do is I can look at the directional arrows and the values for those forces, and I can decide what I actually need to pay attention to. So, I see that I've got an 8,000 Newton normal force and I have an 8,000 Newton force of gravity and I know those will cancel. So the net force that I have acting on my object, I'm just going to represent the car with a box rather than redraw it, is that I have 2,000 Newtons going in this direction and I have 1,000 Newtons going in this direction, which further simplifies because they are in opposite directions, down to 1,000 newtons in one direction. So I can go from this, this graph, to the, or this diagram, to this diagram, to this diagram, and I'm kind of increasingly going and becoming more and more simple as we go. 
Now let's say that a prompt asked me to go ahead and find the acceleration of the car. Well, we've got a couple of ways that we can do this. We know that Newton's second law stated that force is equal to mass times acceleration. And we're going to use this quite a bit. Now in order to find the acceleration of the car, we need to figure out how much force is being applied to it. And in this case, we've already simplified it down. We know there's 1,000 newtons of force being applied to the car. So we have our force. We're good to go on, on F. We're trying to solve for A. We need to find the mass of the car. And we can actually do that with the information that's been provided. Because one of these other forces will tell us all about the mass of the car. And that's gravity. So I know the force of gravity, just like all forces, is also equal to m times a. And I happen to know that the acceleration of gravity is 10 meters per second squared. This is a number that we have used quite a bit as our a value for other problems. And we can use it as the a value here for gravity, which means that 8,000 newtons of force is equal to some amount of mass times 10. And if I go ahead and do the math correctly, I find out this is an 800 kilogram car. It's a very, very small car, but we have a value for it. So I'm going to go ahead and take this value for 800 and bring it down to my final solution. So if force is equal to mass times acceleration, and I know there's a thousand newtons of force acting for my car, there's 1,000. I know that my car is 800 grams, or 800 kilograms, times some value for A. I can go ahead and divide both sides by 800. And with a little calculator work, or you can do it on paper if you want to, you'll find out that the acceleration for our car is going to be 1.25, and that is in meters per second squared. So with one object, I can see I've gone ahead and I reduced my forces down until I had one net force acting on the object. I was able to find the mass of the object by looking at how big the force of gravity was. And then I was able to apply Newton's second law to that in order to figure out what the acceleration of the object was going to be. Now that's a fairly simple example. Let's take a look at a more complicated one. So for my more complicated example, I'm going to go ahead and use an Atwood's machine, kind of like what I spoke about in the introduction video. So let's say that I have a 10 kilogram block that is attached by a rope and a pulley to a seven kilogram block that's hanging off of a ledge. So there's our setup for our, uh, our Atwoods machine. Now we've got a little bit of information that we already have, but what I really want to do is I'm going to find the acceleration of the 10 kilogram block. So we're going to go and find the acceleration of the 10 kilogram block. Now there's a couple of other pieces of information we probably want to know about this. We should know that our coefficient of friction is going to be a number. Um, let's make it a very, very low coefficient of friction. 0 0.05, for instance. And we need to have a little bit of an understanding about the rope and the pulleys. Now for this class, in just about every situation you are going to deal with, we are going to say that the, uh, the pulley itself is frictionless. So there's going to be no resistance from the pulley, it's able to spin freely. Also we need to define a little bit about something with the rope. We're going to say that the rope has no mass and is unbreakable. So we can't snap the rope, and the rope is not going to affect the mass of the system. 
So let's go ahead and see if we can solve this specific setup. So the first thing we're going to do in following with our strategy is we're going to go ahead and identify the forces that are acting on the entire system. Even though we are going to go ahead and just be really specific about the 10 kilogram block, let's go ahead and make sure we understand all of the forces acting on the system. So the first thing I'm going to identify is that we definitely have a force of gravity on the 7 kilogram block. We also have a force of gravity on the 10 kilogram block. We have a normal force on the 10 kilogram block. We have a force of tension that is going to act upwards going through the rope on the 7 kilogram block. And that same force of tension is going to be applied over here to the 10 kilogram block to get it to slide across the table. And finally, we are expecting some amount of resistance. So we are going to have a force of friction. So we've identified all of the possible forces acting on our system. Now that we've identified them and we've given them a direction, let's go ahead and quantify some of those forces. And then we can go ahead and simplify and solve this thing. So, I know that the force of gravity on this block is going to be the mass of the block times the acceleration due to gravity on the block. And since I know that acceleration of gravity is always going to be 10 in the downwards direction, I know that this is going to have a total force acting on it of 70 newtons. Now, that 70 newton force is going to pull downwards and that force is going to be applied through the string, so I happen to know that this force is also 70 newtons. So we can go ahead and start looking at just our 10 kilogram block now. So I've got a 70 newton force going in the rightwards direction. I know that the force of gravity on the block once again is going to be equal to mass times acceleration and so I'm going to wind up with 10 times 10 or 100 newtons of force. And if you're confused as to where I'm keep getting this 10 number from, Remember that acceleration due to gravity is always equal to a 10 in the downwards direction or negative 10, and that's meters per second squared. So if I've got a block with a weight of 10 kilograms and an acceleration of 10 or meters per second squared, I'm going to get 100 newtons in the downwards direction. I know that this object is not falling through the floor, so I know that I've got 100 newtons in the upwards direction as well, and that's going to be equal to my normal force. And then finally, we have our force of friction. And our force of friction is going to require a calculation. So we know that the force of friction is equal to the coefficient of friction times the normal force. And since I know that my normal force is equal to 100 newtons of force, and my coefficient of friction was given to me as 0.05, my force of friction is going to equal 5 newtons, or 0 0.05 times 100 newtons. So I know that I will have a force of friction of 5 newtons. So I've got 100 up and 100 down. Those will go ahead and cancel. I've got 70 to the right. I've got 5 to the left. So that's going to leave me with 65 newtons um, acting to the right. And so if I go ahead and I can simplify this, I'm going to have a single box with a single force acting on it of 65 newtons. And I know that my box was 10 kilograms. And so if I want to go ahead and wrap this up and solve for the acceleration of the box, which is what the original prompt asked for, I can go ahead and say that the forces acting on the box, the net force acting on the box, will be equal to the box's mass times the box's acceleration. So 65, which is the net force acting on the box, is going to be equal to 10 kilograms times A. The acceleration on this object is going to be 6.5 meters per second squared. And that is how you can solve an Atwood's machine problem. Now, there's a couple of other setups that we can use for Atwood's machine problems, but if you solve it with the same way by first identifying your forces, identifying the directions of those forces, and then quantifying, simplifying, and solving, you will get the answer consistently every time. So, hopefully that will help you with those type of problems.
So there you have it. That is how we can use forces and Newton's laws and all of these things together to predict where and how an object is going to move. Hopefully you found these examples useful and I'll see you in class.